We've been talking about the importance of prayer the last few weeks, and we'll continue with that subject this morning. Paul, in his letter to the church of Thessalonica, in the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, he mentions several responsibilities and duties that we have as believers in Christ Jesus. And just want to read a few verses here. Just draw our attention to this and be on target. Verse 14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and all men. Then he says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, and then mentions quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from the appearance of evil, and the list goes on and on and on. Good things, amen? <laughs> the thing I want to focus on, when he said right here in the center of this passage, pray without ceasing. Now, I think we'll all agree And I don't like to preach on prayer and put a guilt trip on people because we probably say to each and every one of us, we need to pray more. And uh, it's probably one of the greatest challenges, prayer, uh, in the Christian life. I think one reason because we have to transition from the natural realm to the spiritual realm. And we're so used to being in the natural realm and getting up, doing things, and going here and there and the responsibilities, we have a lot of good things. I mean, uh, the Bible exhorts us that we uh, take care of ourselves, that we show kindness, love towards other people, that we work hard, that we're generous, that we're kind, we're patient, and a number of things we do. But then when it requires for us to, to move from here into the spiritual realm and pray into a a God that we've never, probably never seen with our eyes or touched or smelt. And sometimes it's difficult for us to just make that transition. I know it's not an easy thing for me. I, I have a, a set time in the morning. I spend the first part of my day in my devotion. I have a devotional that I read. I journal. I read through the Bible. And... Uh, I, use, I have my iPhone, I have the Bible on it, and maybe I need to find me another way of not just relying on, on the iPhone with the Bible because what, when I pull that thing up, the first thing that pops up is the temperature. And then I want to say, oh, what, is it going to rain or snow or the sunshine today? And then I'll look and then I'll see, oh, there's a message here from uh, someone and then uh, our next, oh, th- there's the news. And here I'm supposed to have this devotional time. What I'm doing is being distracted. And when, when you try to transition from this realm into the celestial realm, there's a lot of distractions. Not if, so maybe take the iPhone and just make a living sacrifice. <laughs> Boom. And uh, I live most of my life without it. But, um, so I think not only that, but just if you didn't have the iPhone be in a form of distraction in your mind, in your mind, you multitask. You can be praying, and then all of a sudden you find yourself wandering out in the field somewhere and trying to focus and, and just, you know, calm yourself down. That is a real struggle for me. I don't know if that happens to you, but it does me. And I, I believe in reading the Word of God. I believe in having a quiet time. I believe in, in praying. And uh, Diana is a, is a good reminder of me because we pray together every evening. And uh, a lot of times she comes and reminds me because uh, Matt Dillon has got my attention. And that old scutter, I got to get rid of him. And she'll come in and say, yes. So, I mean, so... Th- when the, the discipline of prayer is not an easy thing. It's, am I right? 
Am I preaching to the right group of people here? Maybe you're up here and I'm down here. Maybe. I don't know. So, I mean, but the Bible is so clear that it's a discipline that's not naturally acquired. I didn't, I wasn't born with this thing. I need to pray without ceasing. I need to spend time with the Lord. And, and two weeks ago, we said the primary purpose of prayer, primary purpose of prayer is for us to get in tune with God, to hear him. I used to think prayer, effective prayer, was uh, me taking the Lord's Prayer and breaking it down to seven stations and then praying for one hour without taking a breath. I said, well, I've done something great, you know. And the Lord said, did you hear anything I said? I said, say what? And so I come to find out a lot of times prayer is according to the book of Ephesians, bring your, with thanksgiving, your petitions and requests unto the Lord. But also, as it says so often in the book of Revelation, he that hath an ear, let him speak. <laughs> he that hath an ear, let him hear. And I've said this often, the Lord one day said to me, will you shut your yapper? I have something I like to say. Realize that I need to just calm myself down, focus, and say, Lord, I need to hear your voice. I need to draw close to you. James, the brother of Jesus, said it so clear. Just don't be a hearer of the word, but then be a doer of the word. You learn prayer and the discipline of prayer by doing it. Not just thinking, well, I'll, I'll pray whenever I need. And Paul is giving the admonition of praying without ceasing. So when you look in the Bible, you can see several examples where people had this discipline working in their lives. I think one of the greatest examples in the Bible of a person who was disciplined concerning prayer incessantly was Anna, the prophetess. Now, she, Simeon, and I'm sure there were a lot of other people who read the old covenant and realized that Jesus, the Messiah, was coming. She, it says, she had a particular calling. She remained in the temple it says she prayed day and night, worshiping, fasting, praying. And when Joseph and Mary brought the infant Jesus to the temple, going through that particular purification rite and honoring and acknowledging, you might say, a baby dedication, Anne was there and recognized Jesus as the redemption of Israel. She saw Jesus was our salvation, her salvation. Simeon also. It says she was, at that time, 84 years of age. I don't know how long she had spent doing that, but she qualified for someone who was praying without ceasing. And now I realize that if I did that, I couldn't do what I'm doing right now. I, I wasn't called to be similar to the exact calling of Anna the prophetess, but there are people today who fulfill that calling that God gave me. You need to be obedient to what God has called you to do, but that does not exempt you from praying. We see also in the early church, there was a crisis that took place. Acts chapter 12. It says this, that... Peter was imprisoned by Herod Agrippa I. He was the heir, the son of Herod the Great, the guy who built that summer palace up on top of Masada in the Judean desert. Been there, seen that. Impressive place. And that was his summer 
palace. And Herod the Great was the one who attempted to do away with Jesus Christ when he was a young baby, two years and under. And he put out that decree to kill all children two years of age and under, trying to exterminate. He was a tool of the devil. Didn't work. So you had Herod Agrippa, and what he does, he somewhat follows the same lifestyle and the same administration as dad, and he imprisoned Peter because Peter was preaching the gospel. The early church went into prayer. They were praying without ceasing for his deliverance. And then God sends an angel, takes him from chains, removes the chains, takes him through several uh, places within the prison. He had to go through different gates and release him outside the prison. And um, when this young woman named Rhoda saw him, was amazed because here the early church has been praying for his release, and she, with excitement, runs back to where the disciples are and others in the church who were praying, and she gives this good news. Peter's out of jail. A miracle's taken place. He's been released. They said, you're crazy. Now, it's interesting. You're praying, and then God answers prayer, and you don't believe it. <laughs> They were surprised. What in the world? How, how did this happen, you know? As we know in the book of Hebrews, it tells us to show hospitality to strangers because you don't know, you may be entertaining an angel unaware. And I'm sure that many of us have had angels who have protected us, who have intervened in our lives, and we've probably not known it, can't prove it, but Hopefully you have a witness, you know that God did something special and miraculous in your life, protected you, or watched over you in a crisis situation. But here you see a crisis situation brings the church to the knees and they're praying without ceasing. Paul prayed without ceasing for the Roman Christians. He says that in Romans chapter 1, verse 9. I continue to pray that you will grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul, as I already read this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, he says to the church at Thessalonica, composed of many Gentiles, pray without ceasing. So I, I come to this point in my message. What does that mean, pray without ceasing? Does that mean that you are speaking to God all the time? 24-7? No, it's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that we have an awareness of his presence and continually listening to him. If I stayed here at the church, had diner bring my meals here and, and prayed without ceasing, continually praying and listening to God all the time, you would have to find another pastor. I, I have not got the same calling that Anna had, neither probably many of you. But that doesn't mean we stop praying. So to me, what it says pray without ceasing means... Prayer is a pivotal part, a primary part of the believer's life and that you continually are aware of the presence of God. I'll tell you what, if you think that way, it'll change your life. It will. It'll cause your hands to be clean, your heart to be pure. That in darkness, in a seclusion, you'll behave the same way when you're in the light. Because you are aware that God is present. Amen. See, you don't need to come to church to kneel down to pray to God. When I drove to Birmingham this week, it was three hours to Birmingham and three hours back. And I was conducting a funeral there. And um, 
So when I'm driving over, driving back, I spend time talking to the Lord. And I don't even have to verbalize things. I can thought talk to God. I can be in a traffic jam and thought talk to God. Continually aware of his presence. And I needed to listen clearly to the Lord because I was driving to Birmingham. The funeral was at 1 o'clock. I got there real early because I forgot to set my watch to Alabama time. And I said, these people are late. I was early. They were on time. I didn't figure that out until I got home. And Sarah said, where you been today? Well, I went to Birmingham, and those people were late. She said, did you take in consideration the time change? I go, no. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Is that part of being a senior citizen? <laughs> Some say yes. <laughs> Amen. God help us. Amen. So I, I need Jesus more now than ever before in my life. Amen. <laughs> we need him all the time. So when someone says to you, and sometimes people brag, oh, I take the Bible in a literal sense. <laughs> you need to look sometimes at the symbolism in the Bible. You need sometimes to see a prophetic explanation of what the Word of God is saying. Sometimes you don't take the Bible literally, like it says, if your right hand offend you, cut it off. If your eye offend you, pluck it out. Does that mean take it in a literal sense? No. Some people have done that. Now, years ago, driving down to the Gulf Coast, it was uh, just outside of Mobile, and there was a guy walking in the middle of the night down the highway na naked and he evidently had cut his hand off or something because it was offending him. And I heard about that and I saw that and recognized what the newspaper said, put one and one together and figured it out. And some people, that is not the voice of God speaking to him. That's the enemy taking scripture say you need to understand and interpret this in a literal sense and brings harm and destruction to life. So, sometimes you read the Bible, it's in a literal sense, you say amen. Sometimes God is using apocalyptic language to say something, particularly when you read the book of Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation, all right? You need to look at the context, you need to look at the historical setting and who God was talking to, and see the progressive revelation and also not get confused. There's a lot of things in the Bible that I understand. There's a lot of things I don't understand. And if you're smart and you're in tune with God, you'll just be honest with yourself and others. And sometimes the best answer I can give to someone, I don't know. Now, when you read Romans chapter 11, verse 33, it says, some of the things that God does in our lives... In our world, they're past understanding. God's ways are not our ways, Isaiah the prophet said. So, when I look at this scripture, pray without ceasing, I don't see that in a literal sense. I'm what God is saying, don't stop praying, but you need to be continually aware that I am forever with you. Amen? And you need to listen to me. And I understand this. Uh, one thing is when we learn, we do not learn when we speak. We learn when we listen. That's been one of my problems. I'll be honest with you. I, you know, Paul says you need to acknowledge your weaknesses so you can become strong in me because my grace is sufficient for you. And one of my problems over the years, I've, I haven't been a good listener sometimes. My definition of success in God is being able to hear the voice of God and obey Him. You don't have to have the biggest church facility, campus, budget, and all that. You, to be successful in God requires you to be faithful to what God's called you to do. 
And I encouraged a bunch of pastors recently and said, most of you guys think when you get out of seminary, Bible school, that you're going to be the next great Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or you're going to have a mega church. I said, most of you guys won't have that and you need to get smart, grow up, mature, and realize that God's called you to be faithful where he's planted you. He might plant you in the middle of the desert somewhere. Or he might plant you in this place or another place. Just be faithful. The book of Luke says when Christ returns, will he find faith? Those who are giving substance of what they're hoping for and walking with him. And the way we do that is being aware of his presence no matter where we are. And a lot of times, if you understand that he is right there with you, sometimes you would shut your mouth, put a bridle on it, as James tells us we need to do. He says we need to be quick to listen, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. One, two, three, a good Baptist sermon, amen? The reason I pick on Baptist is because that's what I came from. One of the great denominations of the faith. Amen? Hallelujah. All the Baptists said, Amen. <laughs> All the Methodists said, Oh, no. no. <laughs> All the Catholics said, Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. That's what I like about our house. We have a good melting pot here. We have people from the heathen church, we have people from the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, Nazarene Church. And so, really, we are the body of Christ, which is the most important thing. Can you say amen? See, Jesus called this church, and he called it particularly, and he, as he says in Matthew chapter 21, my body of believers shall be called the house of prayer. He didn't say preaching, teaching, nothing wrong with that. But he did say, specifically, a house of prayer. Amen. Also, we see so clearly in the, in the scriptures that uh, many times what will bring us to our knees is an emergency, a crisis. That's true, isn't it? it then you can take what Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, in a literal sense, pray without ceasing. Because when you find yourself in a crisis situation, it will bring you to your knees. Because we need God. We need God all the time. I remember when, in 2001, when we had that crisis in New York City, Washington, D.C., and what happened in Pennsylvania, the 9-11 crisis. I heard the liberal news media said, we need to pray. That done away with a lot of atheism because they denied the existence of God, good and evil. And they had to admit that evil really did surface. Because for them to acknowledge that there was evilness, they had to measure against something that was good. So that kind of caused them to contradict themselves. A crisis situation, and I remember hearing on the news, we need to pray. Well, America was repentant for about two weeks and went back to sin as usual. But we still need to pray for those in authority that we may live in peace, that we can still spread the good news. Amen? Particularly, our nation now is so divided. Our House of Representatives, our Senate, so divided. A house divided will not stand. That's Bible. Not even taken in a literal sense. That's not only true in, say, our homes, but the house that we live in here, this country, America. We need to pray for a Holy Ghost move, a revival of God to take place, a great awakening in America. 
And we need to believe that and do what God's called us to do where we have a sphere of influence, where we live, where we are involved in everyday life situations. Every one of us needs to make more time for prayer. Can I, can I get an amen on that? Amen? And like I said, you don't have to have a prescribed setting for us to be able to do that. We just need to be continually aware. I hope we don't need to have a crisis in our, in our lives and for us to get on our face before God that we spend time. We need to do our homework ahead of time. We need to be in tune with God. One thing that when I meet with other pastors, and this can be somewhat intimidating, is to ask the question to those in attendance, what is God saying to the earth today? What is he doing today? What's happening today in this world that we live in? Sometimes people will question the sovereign, all-powerful, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God. If he's in charge, then why is everything in such chaos? And you can see that when you look in the history of the Bible, at times when a nation would turn their back on God and begin to acknowledge and worship heathen gods made of stone, wood, hay, and stubble, you might say. And then he was merciful in bringing judgment to bring them back to a place of repentance. In our nation, we're not, not talking about other places in the world, but our nation, which has a foundation, our Constitution, Bill of Rights, and what we believe, founded by 90% of the people who put those things in motion, in play, were believers. And we have that good foundation in America, but we have strayed a long ways from what God originally initiated and founded our nation upon. And our laws based upon our understanding of the Word of God. But we as a nation have fallen away. And I pray, as Daniel prayed for his nation, God, I repent on behalf of my people for what's transpired. God will hear a broken and a contrite heart. Who has the truth in this world we live in? Who has the truth in this nation we live in? Who has the truth of this city we live in? The church. I don't expect someone outside the church who is lost in their sins and trespasses to be able to intercede and pray and call on the name of the Lord God Almighty. They're spiritually already dead and need to be lifed. And a lot of the things that our world leaders and our nation, nation leaders are trying to implement through passing more legislation and laws and spending money here and there is not really dealing with the root of the problem. The root of the problem in the world when we see all the chaos and all the drugs and the crisis on the border, what's taking place in our nation's capital can be rooted in the heart of man, which is evil and deceitful above all things. What will cause a person to be deceived and led astray and messed up, not from without, but from within? There's the problem. Passing another gun law will not keep someone from taking a gun and shooting another person they don't know. The problem is right here in the heart of man. And a lot of people in the world don't want to hear that. And they'll say things like that. What good does prayer do? The reason they say that because they don't know the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's why we need to stand in the gap and pray for those who are lost. I know when, when I am called on to conduct a funeral here in Kennesaw or Woodstock or another place, I don't pull out Sermon 1005 that I preached a year ago at Joe or David or Sally's funeral. 
But I got to hear from God to say at that particular time to hear what those people need to hear. And so it requires a lot of prayer. And I'll pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, have mercy on these people. Because from my conversation with those who survived, be a husband, a wife, or a son or a daughter, when I ask the question that is most on my heart and mind, I'll say to them, what was your dad, your mom, your brother, or sister's relationship with the Lord? I remember one lady clearly said, he didn't have one. I said, these people really need to hear the gospel. I will not back away from that and always present the gospel of Jesus Christ. What an apropos time when people are dealing with the mortality of their life and the reality of death for them to hear what they need to hear. Amen? So, praying without ceasing means you're aware of the presence of God continually and that you are listening to him and making room in your life, first and foremost, so that you can be on the same page with him in your understanding, particularly in the decision-making process. Choices. I want to make the right choice. I want to make the right judgment call in handling your finances, in handling your time, your life, your relationships, everything you do. You know why it's so important? Because God is at the end of time looking at the beginning. He knows what's going to happen when you get in your car and start driving down the road. One of the most dangerous places to be in the world is on the highway. And so we need his angels protecting us, particularly when you drive from Indiana down to Woodstock, Georgia. Right, Tony? I was driving from New York uh, to here. It took me 18 hours, and my sister kept calling me because she was concerned about me, my sister Carolyn. Sheila wasn't because she's already in prayer. I know. <laughs> she said, how you doing? I said, I just woke up. <laughs> what? Yeah, I had a good nap, you know, and I went through Virginia. And um, I did have a guy, an 18-wheeler, who tried to crowd me off the road. And he did a Christian thing. I took down his license plates and called his boss. Now I got him fired. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> Thought about it. <laughs> but anyway, I just <laughs> backed off, said, you want the highway? It's all yours. <laughs> Can't fight with 18 wheeler. But the point I'm making is that prayer needs to be a predominant part of our life that we're continually aware of the presence of God. In conclusion, God should always be on our minds, which is praying without ceasing. This will keep your hands clean and your hearts pure. When Jesus before he ascended into heavens, his disciples were gathered with him. In the 28th chapter of Matthew, he said this. He gave them a commission, and we know it, and we call it the Great Commission. And he said something at the conclusion of his words. He says, teaching each and every person to observe all the things I commanded you, I want you to tell and spread the gospel to make disciples. And then he says this, I will always be with you even to the end of the world. I mean, God is a promise keeper. We might drop the ball. Sometimes maybe we don't put our faith and trust in the Lord like we should. But he'll never leave you or forsake you. One thing I find in the book of Hebrews that talks about the unchangeableness of God, the immutability of God, it says he keeps his word and he never changes his mind. Lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. 
So spend time in prayer. We have women who meet here on Wednesday who've been praying for years, the women of fire. We meet with the men. We always have a time of prayer. I meet with the pastors. We always have a time of prayer. We have corporate prayer meeting here every Sunday evening from 6 to 7. Everyone's invited. I know everybody can't be every place at the same time. One thing we can do, even when we're not assembled together, we can always be thought-talking to the Lord. Can you say amen? Please stand.